Hey everyone, welcome back to Side Talk. Tonight I have Glenn Duns Dunsweiler. <laughs> he is an author and an entrepreneur, and he is passionate about homelessness. And he is going to educate us tonight on some things that he's learned along his journey and the message that he's trying to share with everyone. So welcome to the podcast, Glenn. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's going to be fun. Yes, absolutely. So the first thing I want to ask you is, did you go to college? And if you did, what was your major? Yes, I went to college, uh, both undergrad and graduates. My major was technical theater or design and production for live entertainment. That's kind of the way you look at it. Okay. So before becoming an entrepreneur, what did you do for a living? Uh, most recently, I was a university professor. So I got into academia in Las Vegas at UNLV and started, I was the resident lighting and sound designer for the dance department for a year. I was a visiting assistant professor. And then I was trying to get to Los Angeles and there was a job that opened up for resident lighting and sound designer at U University of California, Riverside. And then that also was a lecturer position. So I was teaching classes and I was designing for live production. And then my last posting was I went to a tenured track uh, professorship at California State University, San Bernardino. And by that time I was teaching video production, filmmaking, <laughs> Uh, production management, lighting design, sound design. Basically, if you knew how to make it, uh, if you want, to, if you wanted to know how to use technology to tell a story, I was the guy to to kind of guide you and to to teach you. Wow. So, what happened that led you to entrepreneurship? Do you still teach on the side, or did you leave that all together? So, I found myself absolutely stuck in in academia. My parents were both teachers. And so their idea of success was go to school, get a degree and get a job. And if you want a higher paying job, you go back to school, you get a higher degree, and then someone will pay you more money for a new job. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> that is uh, not a quite an accurate way of the way the world works. So what I found is when I was teaching at university, uh, one, it was, I didn't enjoy the environment so much. And two, I thought I was worth more and the university <laughs> said, no, you're not. And I just thought, well, how, how does this work? <laughs> and so uh, at the same time, I had gone through the housing crisis in 2008 and I'd purchased the house in 2006. And so I got to see firsthand the complications of how people become homeless in, in the United States. And that really intrigued me. And my students were graduating with degrees in theater saying, how do I get a job? This is not transferable to anything that someone's looking for. And I really didn't have any answers for them. So I had made this film about homelessness in 2010, and I was still teaching at universities, but I was really unhappy. So in 2015, I left universities to focus on the business side of entertainment, and I moved to Los Angeles. And I started learning all these entrepreneurial skills, and I thought, these are the things my students needed to know. <laughs> ah, I have to teach them. So one of my books is actually, my second book is actually getting entrepreneurial st skills to students. It's called A Degree in Homelessness because arguably I got a degree in homelessness. <laughs> I got a degree in something that got me stuck, that got me not moving forward in a capitalist society. So what, what was it that got you up close and personal with homelessness? Did you know some people that were homeless or did you? No, so, so my bank, so in 2000, we bought the house in 2006. Mm -hmm. And then in 2008, I got cut back at work because 
everybody invested into the subprime loans to include universities. So everybody had to cut their budget. <laughs> and the way they cut their budget is they cut their staff hours. And at the time, um, I was not a tenured track. I was, I was a, a staff member. And so they said, you know, you were working, we were paying you for 40 hours a week. Now we're going to pay you for 25. <laughs> I said, uh, how do I make my mortgage? So I called my bank and I said, hey, in about four months, I'm going to run out of top end savings to be able to make my mortgage every month. What can I do here? And they said, you're going to have to stop paying us before we'll even talk to you because until you stop paying us, you haven't proven that you don't have the money. And as far as we are concerned, if you keep paying us, then we're good. <laughs> I thought. Crazy. Like they want what? you to like hit rock bottom before they help you rather than right. you're trying to be responsible and say, hey, this right. is going to happen. What can I do? That's yeah. So, so, so that went back to the way my parents raised me and this whole idea of what was right, what was wrong what was um, upstanding of you and, and what was not, not right. And what I found is the, some of the systems, the larger systems to include the capitalist banking systems were using that as leverage against you. So if you were upright and you just came to them, they took you for granted. And I just thought, okay, my mind, whatever my parents taught me is no longer valid anymore. It has to be somehow reworked in my brain to not be taken for granted or taken advantage of because this is not right. I mean, the, the biggest story as we were in 2012, I was finally able to short sale my house and we had struggled through modification after modification, and it was crazy and long and bizarre, but I didn't go homeless, right? So that was good. Um, and my realtor, we had, we had purchased a, a HVAC system, a HVAC system, new HVAC system for the house, maybe five years before, but it was a $14,000 HVAC system, and we were still paying on that loan. And so we're short selling. And I said, but we still have to pay this loan. How does this work? Because I mean, I can't take the system with us, but I still owe this. I still owe this. I took this deal on. And by the way, short selling killed me. I just thought I made the deal. I have to stand by the deal. That's what they want you to do. Right. And so, um, my realtor said, you just have to let it go. You don't understand. Everybody who makes an investment who knows what they're doing ensures themselves against the risk. You have not insured yourself against the risk. And part of their insurance is that you will take on this risk infinitum. And I just thought, oh, okay, my head is going to explode. <laughs> but that's the way the world works. I mean, it's all about risk versus reward. Money is a game and it's not what we are told, especially in the middle class, the lower middle class, what money is. Money is, is a lot of things, but it's not this thing that should tie you to your life because at the end, what is the meaning of life, right? You have to, is, is the meaning of life debt? Right. Is that what? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, okay. So you're going through this short sale. You, you see how one minute you're working, you're making money. The next minute your hours are cut. Things are all over the place. You got to get rid of your house. So now you learn that you, people need these skills because your students come to you and say, Hey, I can't find a job. What do I do? What did that all of that stuff happening, what did that propel you into as an entrepreneur? What did you create? Sure. So as far as entrepreneurship, I have, because I still know how to tell stories using equipment and the best way to tell stories. So there's this, this, this video coaching side of me that is the, the 
the straight business, I think the, the easy, understandable coaching business on the one side, the now money, right? How are you going to make month now money? But my social entrepreneurship is about getting this information out. And it's about trying to access the people that don't normally listen to things about money, things about how people can become homeless, what it's like to become homeless, who homeless people are. I'm trying to fix the homelessness conundrum in the United States because it's a huge community problem that we're trying to fix with capitalism and it just doesn't work. So I'm trying to get that into the hearts and minds of the, of, of, of the population via my TEDx talk, via my books, uh, via public speaking, via interviews like this. And so uh, at some point, it will be public speaking entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. It will be, but right now, the social entrepreneurship are, are these books and this documentary I made about homelessness across the US. And it's just putting these, these products out there that tell stories that try to, to, to grow people into wealth one story at a time right? That's kind of, I'm using my background in telling stories to propel that mission. So from your point of view, how would you break down homeless people? Like we all see different types of homeless people. Tell us what you see. Sure, sure. So it's really unique and interesting because different cities have more of one population of homeless people for different reasons. For example, um, and in 2008, in the housing crisis, in the South, it's still highly segregated and it's still highly, if you're of color, you are on the line of poverty, right? And so when that housing crisis hit, the first people to fall into homelessness were of color. So in the South in 2008, if you were homeless, well, that meant you were of color because there still weren't, there was this barrier of income that, that still shielded a lot of pale people <laughs> from becoming homeless. But if you're in the Pacific Northwest, there's a huge uh, bunch of youth that end up coming West to kind of, they come from messed up families all over the United States. And there's this big myth, go West young man, young woman to rechange change your life. And so all these people would go to the West and they'd, they'd ride the rails from San Diego all the way up to Seattle. And a lot of them were hooked on heroin. And so when you said homeless in Portland, oh, you're talking about a 19 year old heroin addict right? Because that's who we saw a lot of. We're not talking about the black man. There's not the black man homeless in, in Portland. There's the black man homeless in Memphis, right? And so even though there are all kinds of, of, of homeless, and then there are the, the, the women with children that are running from abusive relationships, that are hiding in cars, that don't want to be seen. There are the families that just because of economics, because of getting cut back at work, because of uh, injury and and no no social structure to help them when they fell down whatever they fell down from it could be mental illness it could be physical illness it could be losing a job whatever their background of of tragedy is there was nothing no one to catch them for free because the only way we can answer it in capitalism is for paying people <laughs> and unless you have for for paying people money you you go homeless. <laughs> and so there are a lot of people Well, you also run into veterans everywhere, because at some point, someone is struggling with some, some demons that no one that is in the civilian world really understands or can or wants to deal with. Mm -hmm. And so you end up with a lot of veterans that have a specific life view and specific problems that are just kind of floating through uh, and getting a little help when and where they can, but our social, our social net is so full of holes it, that, that you end up as a, as a person in poverty, and I call it super poverty, but it's, it's homeless. It's mean, you don't have, you don't have consistent shelter over you. You'll get a little help for a little while somewhere. 
and then it will fall out. So you got to go somewhere else and then you get a little help and you go somewhere. So you all these, these like floating people. Yeah. <laughs> and then in, in, in Southern California, a lot of times you, you'll run in, well, you always run into the chronically homeless, the people that like people in, I, I met people in Philadelphia that'll stay in the freezing cold. Why don't you at least move to Southern California where you don't risk dying of hypothermia and they said well philadelphia is my home i only know philadelphia mm -hmm. and so i ran into san francisco people like that too where it's just as many i always say as as many backgrounds as you meet in a group of people let's say at work or on a bus station at a bus station or at a party that's who you meet out on the street there are pockets and i will say that it's it's people will argue with me on this, but I constantly run into, there are very few Hispanic homeless people and very few Asian homeless people because my theory, not proven, my hypothesis is those people come from, a, uh, they're generationally closer to a more impoverished community that understands the need for community. So if they have to fit 14 people in a room, they will fit 14 people in a room. And that's not a problem where the American way is once you're 18, get out of my house. <laughs> you have to go make your own. And that leads to a lot of black and white homeless people where they just that they grow up with this idea that I'm, I'm done at, at, at a certain age. And sometimes I ran into a lot of messed up families where kids at 14 get dropped off at bus stations because their parents are just sick of them. And that doesn't happen a lot in Asian and Hispanic communities. They don't let go of their family, just they have that, that background. Does that make sense? Yeah, it really does. So homeless people often attack people, right? We've seen a lot of that in the news lately, at least I'm over here on the East Coast. Um, sure. So um, they do it when sometimes when people are trying to help them or sometimes when people are just minding their business and you know they don't even know what's going on right so how do you know who it's safe to help or try to help or talk to and sure. who do you know to like sure so when i've i've run into granted i'm six foot two I look kind of mean if I want to. I don't smile. If I don't smile, like you're kind of scary. So I have a lot more of a privilege to walk amongst people than someone that just looks like a victim or people would want them to be a victim. Yeah. So I always say, you know, homeless people criminals are criminals and criminals will find a way to be a criminal. <laughs> That's just their priority. Homeless doesn't necessarily mean criminal. Homeless means you don't have a secure place, secure shelter, secure and stable shelter. That's all it means. Now, homeless and severely mentally ill. Yeah, absolutely. Homeless and really drug addicted, drug addicted to the point where they will do anything for any money. They become a criminal who will criminal no matter what, right? Yeah. So it's about having to learn who, who the, how, how feel the vibe of a, of a, of a criminal. And it, you're from the East coast. I've, I've lived in some pretty urban areas you know that vibe, yeah. <laughs> you know the criminal vibe, like, no, I'm not going around there for one reason or another. Um, and it's also just, you can't, you need to make sure that you are safe first, because the, the thing I've actually found is homeless people will victimize other homeless people before they're victimized people out on the street because other homeless people are not sleeping well they're not aware they may be addicted themselves they may have other problems themselves and so if they just got 60 bucks from a check or from selling something that's an easier mark than someone that just got out of a car and has their stuff together and is on their way to work so when i was around the people 
I was always doing something. I was always, I had a direction. I had a directive. If someone approached me, if I, and, and asked for money, let's say, if I had the money and if I was prepared to give the money, um, I had that money, uh, what's the word, not secluded, but sequestered. Right. And so I didn't have, I didn't drag out my whole wallet. Right, you're not pulling give them out them an opportunity. Anymore. I didn't rifle through my purse. Right. I didn't stop, right? If I was going to give money, I would have it ready and I would hand it to them. I'd make eye contact. I'd connect with them as human beings. And this helped me a lot because I, that's one of the things, even though I look kind of mean <laughs> when I smile and when I engage with people, people um, see that I'm a genuine person and they, it, it kind of lifts that they don't want to hurt me. Right. This is even the criminals I, that saved me a lot doing my documentary a couple of times because I was walking around in some rough places and I could tell people were trying to make me a mark. And then they realized what I was doing. And I talked to them like human beings and I connected with them as a person and not as a scared, oh, are you going to hurt me person? And all of a sudden you, you saw that click in their head, like I'm not going to mess with this person, right? I could, I absolutely could. <laughs> I'm bigger than he is. I'm faster than he is, but no, I'm not going to do it. So you just have to make yourself be in a confident position. And if you're not in a confident position, then you need to get away from people that are looking to victimize you. And that's the one thing about being a homeless woman that just changes the game because just your gender makes other perceive people automatically perceive you as a victim. So you have to work even harder to not be perceived as a mark. And that is a confidence thing. That is, I mean, it's something that I can't, teach people but i know i especially uh smaller women women of small stature five foot women are tough because they're used to it right you yeah. don't mess with a five foot tall or, or smaller woman because she has been around and she knows the game and she leads with her energy and i think that that energy will will stop people from messing with you i had one guy who was taller than i was he said, Hey, can I have some money? And cause I, I, I don't look, I, I guess I look like I would have some cash on me. And I said, I don't have anything right now. And he looked at me and he was so mad. He said, what are you on drugs? <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, I mean, that's what it is. I mean, it's a rough world out there. So especially in the world of unsheltered, because you don't know, people would always talk about predators when I was out there. And I just thought I, I, I didn't, this was in 2010. So before sexual predators was really a big thing. So predator right now, predator means sexual predator. But before people would talk about all these predators, like what is a predator? And it's just a criminal that, that views homeless people as a mark. And so as a homeless person, you just have to even put that game forward, that face forward. And again, if you're, you're from an urban community, you know, what that face is, right? You know what that, what that is. And so that, that show of force or that show of, what would it be? Show of confidence, mm -hmm. right? That show of confidence, that show of confidence means a lot because people don't want to enter into problems, right? Yeah. No, they don't, don't want to steal. They don't want to steal money from someone that's going to give them problems. Right. So you did this documentary. Tell us a little bit about what the documentary covered and what the message yeah. is of the documentary. Sure, sure. So at the time, all the documentaries on homelessness I saw were just so sad. <laughs> I was just, I don't want to be sad. I, I want to know what the heck is going on in the United States. And I said, I want to know what's going on in the United States because the other documentaries were about Los Angeles or they were about New York or they're about Chicago or they're about Atlanta. And what that does, people are always looking for an escape to say, well, that's an Atlanta problem or, well, that's a New York problem. <laughs> you know, we don't have homeless here in San Diego or, you know, whatever. Pick, pick any city, Salt Lake City. We don't have homeless in Salt Lake City. Yes, you do. So my documentary was about me going to every region in the U.S. to kind of say, you can't say that this is 
uh, this problem. It's our problem. It's a United States problem. And it's a world problem. But in the United States, our flavor of homelessness comes from different socioeconomic reasons. And um, so we have that where I'd go around and I'd interview homeless people and homeless service providers. So not only the voice from people on the streets or dealing with it, how they got in there, how they succeed while they're there, how they get out of it, what they would possibly need. But I also talk to people that give them services, the people that that are are constantly in contact with the homeless population, the changing homeless population, and asking them, what do you want to say? What do people need to pay attention to? So I got a lot of solutions from homeless service providers. And then the third part was actually watching me try to sleep in my car for a month as I go around the United States. And at the time I was in a Mini Cooper. So <laughs> I'm six foot two in a Mini Cooper. And I'll tell you what, you get to see how easy it is for a straight person, meaning straight, straight of mind, straight of outlook, straight middle class, like, oh, that I know who that guy is, right? He's an upstanding guy. He's approachable. He smiles. In five days, you get to see me turn into a crazy man. <laughs> because when you take away air conditioned sleep in the summer in a comfortable bed, that where 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 cars aren't passing you in the, with a danger and i was sleeping in a car thankfully but there was still this danger of hey someone's going to knock on my window hey you can't sleep here hey move around so you're never getting consistent sleep you're always half the person you normally would be when you're up because you didn't get enough sleep when you're when you're trying to and then things like you watch me we, we take everything for granted, having our food and our shower and our bath and I mean, every and on our sink and everything in one place. And I was freaking out because I was going to have to interview people and I couldn't keep a shirt unwrinkled. And I was just freaking out. I was like, how can I show up to this interview in a wrinkled shirt? I mean, such first world problems, mm -hmm. but that was obsessing about them. And they became these huge things. And you're just wondering, because when you see someone on the street and you think, why are they freaking out about this fish sandwich that I'm trying to give them? When you see how quickly I lose my mind, it becomes apparent why this person is freaking out or why this person is angry with you for no reason that you would think of in the straight world. Why right. this person wouldn't be angry, but it, it, yeah, when you start taking that stuff away, Laszlo's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I guess it's called, right? Just that, that, the how easily you start to just lose your mind. And yeah, uh, and then the lack of sleep definitely contributes because that's messing with your health and your mental stability. So, yeah, all those things. So, um, why do you think entrepreneurial skills will help people be homeless proof? Yeah. So in this world we live in now where you maybe don't have a consistent job from a consistent employer, where you maybe have the opportunity to set up your own Etsy store and sell some things one year and have an opportunity to work for an employer that can pay you for one or two years or maybe a few months. Uh, where you have the opportunity to maybe meet some people with that that have some venture capital, you know, that are looking to invest. Maybe they made a little bit of money, and they're looking to to do something with the money. If you have these entrepreneurial skills, you never get stuck like me because I had a I had a singular life view that was given to me from my parents, and what entrepreneurs have is multiple life views. And the first life view is there's always a solution, right? I come from a very pessimistic people. Pessimism cannot live in entrepreneurship, right? <laughs> and so you have to throw that away. And instead of you looking at what your problems are, you look at what the solutions could be. And I wish I could give these skills to even homeless people because a lot of homeless people, once they get down into that, that sleep deprivation and just despair, you know, they'll, they'll throw up barriers after barrier after barrier for why they can't get out. And their comfort is not getting out, right? That, and that's a very 
as a person that's housed and trying to help them, that's so frustrating. You just throw your hands up, say, I'm done. I'm done with you. Stop telling me what we can't do. Tell us what we can. And so I think those entrepreneurial skills can help everybody from ground up, but especially the middle class that have been told or the students that are coming out that think they have all the answers. Because when you're 19 to 22, you have all the answers. <laughs> and you've been told that if you just read this and have this degree, then you will have success. Mm. Well, these are the tools that will actually have, help you to better figure out how to use the things that you have and what else you need to may, may get in order to move forward. And I think that's why the entrepreneurial skills are so important. Absolutely. So what would you say you have learned from the homeless? Yeah. Priorities is the big one. When you have everything taken away from you, you really, really come to grips with what is important to you. So for example, my, I always tell a story about a family I I interviewed the cooks in Sacramento, uh, three person family, uh, mom, dad, daughter, and a lot of shelters want to separate. It's just women and children and men because men are threats, right? You never know what the background is for men. Men have propensity for violence, men, whatever, bad story, bad story, men, 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 men. Let's just separate that. We got enough to deal with. And their priority was staying together as a family. And so they became very clear on that. It was like, okay, the simple answer would be to split up. Mother and daughter go to the shelter. Father goes out on the street or whatever it is. But that also erodes the family dynamic. And so they said, no, <laughs> that can do what, what can't, what are the solutions? And so they knew their priority was to stay together as a family. And they they kept looking like an entrepreneur calls venture capitalists. And you're just like, this is what I want to do. This is what we're doing. Look, this is amazing. I have an amazing product. I have an amazing family. I don't want to break this family up. Do you want to break this family up? Who wants to keep families together? And that's what they did. And they just drilled on this and drilled. And they, they, they ended up finding a, a, a shelter. It was a, at a church that would allow for families. And I mean, in, in that way, you find these, you find what's really important to you. And maybe it's family, maybe it's your, your creative ideas, or maybe it's some kind of stability, or maybe it's the town you live in. I'm from Philadelphia. I want to stay here. I don't care if it's cold. This is my home. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm starting something new on the Side Talk podcast. So you're my guinea pig tonight, Glenn. <laughs> Fun. Yes. A lot of side talk. I can talk yeah. on the side a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so usually on my podcast, the Oh Hell No podcast, I ask people to share an Oh Hell No moment that has changed their perspective on something or changed something in their life. But on side talk, I'm going to ask you to share an Oh Hell Yes moment. This moment is a moment in your life where you have clarity and feel successful. Uh, yeah, so... Yeah. This is the thing that drives me. And I do this on occasion. I've done this for 10 years. I go out and I pay homeless people for words of inspiration because then I'm telling them they have something to offer. I am giving them money for the, the, the product that they're gonna give me. I have pride in them, therefore they have pride in themselves which usually they, they've lost. So I'm trying to capitalize and switch up the game of what it's like to give panhandlers money. Like I, I, I'm getting something in return and I put this stuff on, on video and I, but to see the smiles and to see the realization that they are human beings and they have something to offer the world absolutely floors me every time. And they turn from, people that won't look you in the eye, people that are ashamed to be alive into proud people for if it's just that one moment, man, there's so much power in mind frame and mindset. And that is the key right there. 
you know, once you let people know they're worth something, they become worth something. It's amazing. That's beautiful. I love that. That's really nice. So it was great having you on the podcast as a guest. Please tell everyone where they can purchase your books and check out your documentary and connect with you on social media. Sure. So everything can branch out from my website. Let me take a sip of water here. I'm getting a little... (laughs) It's getting a little lip smacky. Okay. (laughs) And to say my last name, it needs I need to have a clear mouth. So my last name is Dunsweiler. Everything branches from my website, glendunsweiler.com. It's a heck of a last name to spell, but if you can spell it, you can find me easily. Uh, my uh, Why Homeless, the documentary is on Amazon Prime. So if you have a Prime membership, you can see it now. My books are on Amazon, your favorite retailer. Uh, my TEDx talk is up on the TEDx website. But if you go to glendunsweiler.com, D-U-N-Z-W-E-I-L-E-R, or type in why homeless, or my TEDx talk is called Small Business Homeless, it'll come up there. You can find all that I do, and you can connect with me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Glenn. Thank you.